Hello everyone and welcome to this History Indoors talk. Hopefully you can all hear me and, and everything is going okay. Please do let me know where you're from in, in the comments. I can see there's a few of you and I know more of you will join as the talk goes on because people never join when generally join as it all starts. I've done this now long enough to know that people do generally join a bit later on. Uh, but welcome to History Indoors. If you don't know much about History Indoors, then we are well. We provide free history talks on a range of topics, ranging from the, Ang the Saxons to the Romans, all the way to the 21st century, on a variety of different topics like economic histories, social histories, military history. You, you name it, we've probably given a, a talk uh, on it. Um, so um, it's great to um, you know. Please do check us out. Check out, out all of our videos or our talks beforehand you can see all my old talks about tourism and and other things as well on the Anglo dutch wars if you want to know talks about that do check us out on youtube uh, please subscribe to the channel as well we are looking for more subscribers we're nearly on 1400 subscribers which i think is an incredible number uh, to say the least um i should just say very briefly that normally there's a second person here there's a usually the host i'm also host and speaker at the same time many due to uh, uh, personal uh, reasons our host couldn't be here so i am also hosting as well as speaking. Um, so I've got to do two things at once. So I, I hope you bear with me because I, I have to check the comments for spam spam as well. So if I do get distracted during this talk, uh, do bear with me. I I'm also having to moderate at the same time. So it could get quite interesting. Um, so we'll see how it goes. So do bear with me in that regards. Um, final thing as well, you know, please do ask questions. Um, do say, do say your questions to the end. There'll be a time for q and I'm happy to answer any questions because this is a big topic and I can't, you know, in the time I've got, probably can't do it justice. So please do ask questions at the end. I'm happy to answer uh, anything on the topic as well because this is what I call, I guess, my 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 speciality in some ways. So without further ado, let us let us get started, shall we? And and think about the legacy of the terrible and awful siege of Colchester in 1648, as it was called throughout the centuries. Now, I've started, I started to do this talk. I've, I've given it three years and I haven't given a talk on this topic. You know, this is my speciality in itself um, for many reasons. But I thought now is the right time to do it because it's obviously the 375th anniversary of the siege itself. And I know Colchester itself is doing a lot to, to promote this and to celebrate this and to think about the siege because it's probably one of the most interesting, unique events that happens to the town. Uh, happens in England and happens during the Civil War as well. So it's a very unique topic. So that's one reason why I tried to talk about today is because of the anniversary. The reason why I'm talking about the legacy and not necessarily the siege itself in detail is because, well, if you go on YouTube, there's plenty of talks about the siege and there's many good talks about the siege done recently actually by some local historians. So do go check those out if you want to know the intricate details of the siege itself from beginning to the end and then do go watch those. So I didn't want to kind of add on to that. Uh, I'm no, I know they're fantastic historians. I didn't want to kind of over, overdo their overdo their work or just copy what they're saying because uh, they deserve their own, own credit in that regards. But I thought I could do something different because what people don't do and historians haven't done really is the legacy of the civil wars. They have that has not been a, a, a topic done that often. There's a few things out there, but generally it's not a common t topic. And I thought, you know what, this is time for me to talk about my PhD, which was about this topic itself, the legacy of, of, of the wars. Um, so, yeah, I spent five years studying the legacy uh, in Colchester, politics, tourism, all the ways. Um, and I certainly know way too much about Colchester than any person should know. But I'm also proud of that as well. So without further ado, let us let us begin this this kind of talk through time as we go, go through the 18th and 19th and even the 20th centuries as well in this talk. So before I kind of go legacy, we have to talk about briefly about the siege. I won't go into it too much detail. The siege itself happened in 1648 during the Second Civil War, where um, royalists uprise against the Parliamentarians. The, the, the king has been put in prison. Um, people wanting him to sign a peace treaty to sign the deals that have been presented to him by Parliament. He won't sign it. We see royalist rebellions across the country in, in, in the West, but also in Kent. And we saw to see the Scottish change sides and, and fight for the king, and they marched down towards Preston. Now, Coldest is very much involved in this because the Royalist army in Kent is, is defeated at Maystone and it marches towards throughout Essex. Its main aim is to gather men and troops 
to, to kind of get a big army to help fight the sort of king. Um, it goes through Chelmsford, picks up train bands from Chelmsford. It enters Colchester. I'm not expecting to be having a fight there. Expecting to pick up provisions. Instead, it is siege by Fairfax. And the town goes through a three-month siege, and it's 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 known as a tra- tragic siege. The town set on fire. Buildings are destroyed by cannibals. Um, it's people are starving. Starvation is is known. People eating their you know eating their their, their, their cats, their dogs, and the horses. It's a very tragic time. Uh, diseases is breaking out as well as from from some writers as well. Colchester goes for a very torrid time uh, in 1648. The royalists are besieged and eventually they have to surrender uh, because they hear that the, the Scottish army Preston's been defeated by by Cromwell, and so they decide that they have to give up themselves. But it's a three month siege, one of the probably longest sieges and most brutal sieges that, that the Civil War sees in this period. So that's the siege in itself. But what happens afterwards is quite unique because when the town surrenders, it's, you can remember Colchester here is a parliamentarian town. It's, it's supported the parliamentarians for throughout the Civil War. It's been known as a kind of non-conformist, rebellious town. People talk about John Ball uh, came from Colchester. You know, Colchester has been this rebellious place for a long, long time. And it, it certainly was a staunch supporter of the parliamentarians. But when Fairfax ends the siege, he lumps the town with a fourteen thousand pound fine, which in today's money you're talking about hundreds, if not millions, of pounds. Now, this is a town that had also lost its gentry. Most of its gentry had been killed in the Civil War. The Lucas family have all been killed. One of them was executed just in Colchester after the siege itself. The Art May gentry to help pay this fine. Half of the fines given to the to the Dutch immigrants who have been in the town for two generations, and they pay uh, a fair sum of it. But this is quite important for the legacy of for Colchester because really what happens, Colchester struggles to rebuild itself. The reason why I think many historians would agree with this is because they can't afford to rebuild. They can't afford to tear down. They can't afford to rebuild. It's too expensive to do so. And so there's, these ruins would scatter the landscape. Ruins that have been hit by cannibals, been in fire, by a blaze by, by, by both sides. They can't be rebuilt. They can't be replaced. And so they're left there. Left there. And they've remained there ever since then. If you go to Colchester now, I don't know how many of you are from Colchester. But if you go to Colchester today, you'll find that many of the ruins are still there, uh, which display the tragedy of the siege in the contemporary world. But this aftermath, this, the, the aftermath wasn't just the ruins that were destroyed. The parish churches were, were destroyed or very heavily damaged. We can go through different churches. St. Mary the Wall loses its tower, for example. St. Martin's is completely destroyed, well, not completely destroyed, but heavily destroyed. And obviously St. Bottle's Priory, the main one, the main church of Colchester, as it was then, which is held all the civic functions, was left in complete ruin. And the parish of St. Bottle's ends up meeting in All Saints. And that's a huge thing for people. Parish identity in the, in the 17th, 18th century was crucial it's where you was baptized it's where you were buried it's where your marriages were it's where all your poor leaf was handed out from it was a crucial point for your parish identity it, it was a very important part of of, of 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 who you were and the fact that lost the parish church is a crucial loss for the town as well so this impacts people's social lives as well and there's also a huge drop in population and industry now historians will correct me here and say of course well the town does recover quite quickly, of course. It has a plague that hits them later on, and also the, the worst bit is the Anglo-Spanish War, which completely destroys Colchester's trade. But certainly we find that the Civil War does take out a lot of Colchester's population. It damages its growth, it damages its, its perception, and especially writers writing in 19th century. People like Benham, and I don't, don't know if any of you know Charles Benham, a massive figure in Colchester in the 19th century. He would even write that the reason why Colchester isn't like Birmingham or Manchester he says it's because of the Civil War, because of the siege. And Victorians are seeing the Civil War and saying, this is the reasons why we're not as big as we should be. And we should be as big as other towns throughout England. We should be a massive industrial power. But we're not because of the Civil War destroyed us. And so people would look back and the always look to Civil Wars trying to say, this is the reasons why we're not who we are today. And I think that is interesting. To, and I think about legacy, certainly this will play under people's mindsets later on. So the immediate aftermath is important. The town's given a massive fine. The town is in ruin and people's lives are massively disrupted by what takes place. But another legacy, the reason why Colchester has such a strong legacy of the Civil War, place none, no other place in England I think is like Colchester, really. 
in this in this regard. Maybe New- maybe Newark and a few other places, maybe. But the restoration, sixteen sixty, the arrival of Charles II to the throne of England, will make Colchester a important civil war site for the restoration government. The act of oblivion, for those who, those, for those of us who've grown up in English schools, uh, will know maybe they don't know the act of oblivion as a way for to forget the civil war. Maybe that's what you've been taught. It's a way to forget the civil war ever happened. That isn't true. It's forget the parliamentarians from the civil war, specifically. The idea of the act of oblivion was to basically forget that the parliamentarians ever existed, or at least try to remove some of them from memory. And that certainly worked. If you go to the 18th and 19th centuries, or especially the early 19th century, you'll see that actually most of the stories told are from the warrior's perspective. What happens with Act of Bolivian and in this time is that royalist histories are promoted. And Colchester becomes the site of, of royalism because you had an army that was seized terribly by brutal parliamentarians, as they would say. And two knights, Lucas and Lyle, who were executed in 1648 outside the castle, were, became royalist martyrs. And so Colchester became a, a focal point for royalist myths and for legends. The story went that the grass no longer grew where Lucas and Lyle were shot. The blood of the martyrs was pure and the ground would no longer grow because of it. People flocked to see this site. We know the people came and visited Colchester for that specific reason. Bernard Gascoigne, one of those who's meant to be killed in a siege, goes and visits and he goes to visit the site of the execution purposely. But And he also makes note of the legend himself. But so do many other people who go and visit Colchester. It seems like it's been a draw for people to go and see. And of course, the grass probably doesn't grow on the site because people are on it a lot they're visiting they're trampling it so probably the grass doesn't grow because it's a well-used site that's probably the reasons why the grass no, no longer grows at the site if you go to 19th century 20th century people don't actually believe that anymore but the myth still does seem to pe- perpetuate through society as people still keep bringing up the grass no longer grows where lucas and Lada are buried obviously today that is very very true because there's lots of concrete obelisk on the sites of course, the grass can no longer grow. That was cemented by the Tory Henry Laver, uh, who built a lot of obelisk on the site. And also, what has happened as well was that this impacted how Fairfax was seen. Uh, General Fairfax was obviously the lead parliamentarian and Colchester in the siege. And though he was in pivotal with being back the, the restoration government in 1660, uh, this, country, this whole event in Colchester is a tarnish to his name. Everyone knows Cromwell, don't they? Cromwell from the siege, sorry, from, from the Civil War, sorry. Everyone knows him very, 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 very well, very, very much. Fairfax doesn't get as much attention. I think there's the siege is probably reasons why it it's times his, leg- his legacy because he kills the two knights, and so people see him as a negative way. So the leg- what ha- what happens with Colchester affects also people's reputations. Fairfax never gets the the claim perhaps he should do because of what happens here in 1648 and the royalists make him out to be a tyrant a brutal murderer of two royalist knights and Colchester would hold this this story uh throughout the next two centuries at least and it will tarnish Fairfax reputation for a long time to come so what we see here the, the legacy starts from the ruinous nature of Colchester the fine put on it but also an active Used by the Restoration Government in 1660. Two ways that the Colchester is going to continue remembering the siege itself. And of course, the ruins remain. The ruins survive. And this is an example of four of the ruins uh, in Colchester. These ruins would survive. And when people come and visit the town, uh, for a variety of reasons, what they're going to see, they're going to see the tragedy of the siege. And there's no wonder that when Daniel Defoe visits in 1722, that he says that Colchester still mourns in the ruins of the Civil War. It's so evident for anyone who's visiting Colchester throughout the 17th and 18th centuries that the Civil War took place here. Now, this is important because Daniel Defoe mentions the Civil War. He never mentions the Civil War in any other town he visits. He doesn't do that. The Civil War is is a divisive topic. You don't want to talk about it in in your travel writings. You don't want to talk about it generally in your works. You want to avoid it. Or if you do talk about it, you obviously want to have a certain certain point of view that promotes the king generally. It isn't always the case, but generally seems to be what takes place. Dan Defoe likes to not talk about the Civil War, obviously. But here he feels like he can't not talk about it. And he dedicates 
actually a lot of his time with Colchester about the Civil War, it takes his mind, it takes his attention, and he mentions this, that Colchester still mourns in the ruins of the Civil War. It's still evident. This is 1722. This is about 60, 70, 80 years later, sorry, from the siege. Colchester hasn't repaired, hasn't changed these ruins. They're still there. It's not just Dan Defoe who notes this. Cecilia Fiennes, she, when she goes in the late 17th century, she talks about the ruins that are very evident to her. You couldn't miss them. You couldn't not talk about them. And of course, uh, Anne Taylor, the, the one of those who wrote a Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, when she's only a young child, she talks about in her diary that people are visiting Colchester in the 19th century because of the ruins from the Civil War. It seems to be a talking point. They stay, they remain. I said, just go back to Daniel Defoe just very briefly. He, he even included a siege map. He talks about so much, he includes a map of all, where the ruins are. It, it, such, it seems to take him by, 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 the, by the mind here. He can't get away from it. And so clearly, in the 18th century, people go to see Colchester and they're taken up by what they are seeing. And I said, the ruins are preserved. Now, one reason for their preservation is because, as we said, Colchester couldn't repair them. But we also know that ruins are preserved for two other reasons. One is because local families seem to buy them and look after them. The Hendrick family, for example, buys the Bloodless Priory. Now, we don't know why they are bought. It's not certain why they do buy these ruins and why they preserve them in that way in the early, so in the middle of the 17th century. It's probably because they have relatives buried in the graveyard and they're worried about it being destroyed or demolished and their family memories being lost. It's possibly for that. Also because of the lands and the money that came with the sites as well. So that's reasons why they perhaps are preserved. But more importantly, in the 18th century, we see that a lot of antiquarians start to take interest in these ruins. People like Charles Gray looks after the castle, for example, where many antiquarians from Colchester start looking after these ruins in different ways. They start buying them, preserving them. Why are they doing that? Because they're fascinated by the story that they tell. And so the Civil War lives on in Colchester because the antiquarians are fascinated by them. They're intrigued by the stories, the romantic nature that they give. The story of England from, from Romans to Normans to the Civil War, they're intrigued by them. So they want and look after them. So they are preserved by these kind of uh, these individuals, especially. Sabotas Priory is also preserved by a local parish. People take great pride in their local priory, that even though it's a ruin, they still take pride in it. They're looking after the fence, looking after the graveyard. People also have a connection to these sites as well. So the Civil War in Colchester survives by the work of individuals, 100%, by antiquarians who have a kind of big passion for this. Uh, you know, Charles Gray is a key one. He really looks after the castle after it's been destroyed in the 1680s. Charles Gray, but also local people have a fascination in looking after these ruins in Colchester. So it's down to communities, individuals that preserve this story for us now to talk about in the contemporary world. Again, most towns in England don't preserve their ruins. Bristol doesn't. And many other towns that suffer from sieges do not preserve their ruins. Colchester is unique in this regard its ruins are still evident. But the reason, another reason why the siege survives, yes, it's, yes, the landscape is important. You go and visit it, you see it. You can't miss it, can you? You know, if you go to Colchester today, you see the ruins, don't you? You can't really miss the siege. It's kind of evident in your life. Look at Siege House. It's kind of evident in the name, isn't it? Um, though Siege House actually was only found in 1900s, but that's by and by. It's also survived and becomes a legacy because of local Tory elite. Philip Moran, I don't know how many of you know Philip Moran, but Philip Moran is crucial in preserving the story of the siege. In the 1740s, Colchester loses its charter. Um, this is down to really what they describe as Whig manipulation and corruption in local government. Now, I don't exactly know how much of that is true. It certainly is reported to be as such in newspapers and in records. Of course, yeah, it's probably more complicated than that, m most likely. But Morant's commissioned by Charles Gray to write a history of Colchester to try to restore some pride because Colchester has now taken a massive hit. Its charter's gone. And Morant writes this history of Colchester. He talks about Romans, yes. He talks about medieval Colchester, yes. But most of his book, and if you take a portion of it, he talks about, this, talks about the siege, about how Colchester suffered, the tragedy, 
of Colchester, how Colchester's kind of lingered on, how it stumbled on into the 19th century. But it also talks about the heroic nature of the two knights, of the royalists, and of their, their great chivalry and their bravery and their heroic nature that people in Colchester must replicate themselves. And, Tory, and local Tories use the siege to help try to restore some civic pride in the town. And they do, by a large, do succeed as well, uh, using the siege to do so. Whigs and Tories both use the siege of the Civil War to show loyalty, to show their character, and show that they're willing to do what they do what it takes to change Colchester for the better as well. So the siege is used now uh, for political reasons, but also for civic pride, which is so important in the mid 18th century. And people like Philip Morant will become crucial because local Philip Morant's work would not just be important in 1748 when it's published. No, it will be important in 1848, 1948, and in our contemporary world. Philip Morant's work survives on. Uh, people still use it. Now, it's not always right. It's not always correct about everything. I could talk about some of his flaws and some of his mistakes. But generally, he is so crucial in keeping that story continuing on in people's lives, in consciousness, and understanding their contemporary world about how cultures have suffered and its tragic state that it's in. It's used to help understand their world. I think that's important, how history can be used to help us, help us understand our own contemporary world. It was certainly a case for local Tories in the 18th century. And I use the word Tory boy not as a derogatory term, it's what they were, they were called in the 18th century. The Conservative Party doesn't emerge until the 19th century. So just as a, a point here <laughs> to, to make. But there's another reason why the Civil War comes so survives in Colchester is because of artists and travellers and antiquarians take a fascinating interest in the siege and its ruins. We find many, many images. The person on your screen, I think, is William Starkley, uh, a key antiquarian of the time, who, who draws many of the siege sites. They're fascinated by the ruins. Now, the 18th century is known as the Romantic period, which basically means that people were, were drawing these sites in a romantic way as a picturesque Im image of England. So ruins, buildings, you know, mysticism was, was part in their mind. Ruins were vital for this. And having ruins made Colchester quite an attractive place to go and visit. And if you go to the Essex Record Office, you'll find countless pictures of ruins of Colchester from this, from this time period, because it attracts people to go and visit them. And when they usually draw these sites, quite a few of the counts would talk about the siege, because they wanted to understand why there were ruins. They wanted to understand what had happened. And this links into with what was going on with, with the Royalist kind of restoration story of 1660 martyrdom, heroic deaths, you know, all these kind of things that were going on, tragedy of the town, were very much taken up by the artists and the travellers of the of the 18th century who took to heart what was going on in Colchester, which would be very important, and I'll talk about this later on in this talk, really, is the tourist trade. The artists and travellers' obsession with these ruins and the stories found within, within the ruins, the Civil War stories, would become crucial to tourism in Colchester in the 19th century as well. So there's another reason why the seed survives. Yes, we've got you know, the stories found in the buildings. Yes, we've got the local uh, toilets using it for purposes, but also we've got that romantic nature that they've now provided uh, the, these people to tell stories of England and of martyrs and, and heroes. And this is an example of an image that they drew. You often see them uh, in a very kind of, this kind of form, with people viewing them. I don't know if you can see at, at, at the front there, you've got people viewing these sites. They always drew them, people were looking at them, being kind of taken in by their beauty and by their kind of, their, the mysticism that they offered as well, which I think is interesting to, to, to think about. But let's move on into the late 18th and the 19th centuries and the French Revolution that takes place in 1789. Why is this important a legacy for the siege? Well, the French Revolution terrifies people in England. It really, really does. Whigs, Tories, you name it, are terrified of what's taking place in what's in, in France. In fact, we find from sermons and from newspaper clippings in 1789 that people are going back to the Civil War to understand and to, and to kind of think about what could happen in England. There's certainly, worried, there's certainly worried people in the local elite, especially, that what took place in France is going to take place in England. And so, for example, in St. Peter's Church, uh, 
we find a sermon preached by one of the many rounds in Colchester um, about being loyal to the monarchy, but also he mentions about the idea of siege as well. And, and, and he doesn't mention it in, 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 let's say, in its full extent, but he references it enough that it's clear you know what he's talking about. He's talking about what took place at Colchester in 1648, the tragedy that afflicted upon Englishmen, the tragedy, the trauma that took place, the suffering that took place at Colchester, and that may have never happened in England's shores. We find in 1789 there's there's pictures of Lucas and Lyle that are found that are, that are found in newspapers. We find that people are buying engravings of Lucas and Lyle to show that they're loyal to the monarchy. These are just some examples of what's taking place. The French Revolution has stirred people's thoughts and imaginations, and people are flocking to make sure they are known as loyal subjects. I think of Benjamin Strutt, the 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 kind of high profile wig of Colchester. He certainly uh, makes a painting just before the French Revolution and is certainly a keen supporter of the Royalists, uh, even though he's a Whig. Um, and he clearly makes himself known to be a loyal subject. And what happens? The Civil War is part of that identity. So the reason why the Civil War and the Seas say so prevalent for Colchester is because of the events that take place around. The French Revolution, French Revolution creates a place where the seed is so useful for people. It reminds the populace not to revolt. It reminds people not to rustle against the monarchy because of what happened. And it also people use it to show that they're loyal subjects to the monarchy. And people in Colchester are very, very, very aware of this. And they want to make sure that both sides, Tories and Whigs, want to make the other side aware that they are loyal people to the monarchy. No one wants to be found as a re rebellious, as a revolter. That is certainly not going to be acceptable. The civil war, the siege, is used in this. And throughout the 19th century, with the rise of political parties and unrest, we find the siege is used constantly. Uh, I could go talk about every case that I know of. There's probably too many cases to talk about. This is how often it's used in politics in Colchester in the 19th century. The Conservative Party would certainly use the siege to remind themselves that they are loyal patriots to the monarch. They'd also use it to show that the, the, their character, that they would be on the right side of history. Well, the Liberals would also use the siege to also show that they were on the right side of history. And the, Lord, the Liberals would use originally use the siege to show that the Tories weren't living up to their expectations. In 1820, when there's a, 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 a accusation of corruption in the local government in Colchester, it is the Whigs who use the siege to say these local Tories are not living up to the reputation of Lucas and Lyle. And so it stays in this kind of political sphere throughout the 19th century. Even go to 1894, when you have the Women's Liberal uh, March takes place in Colchester. So not meeting, uh, uh, not a march, a meeting, I should say. They talk about the, the Pompeians coming in and liberating Colchester from the Royalists, from the Tories, from the Conservatives. Same principle here. Now, a very different way of looking at it, because in the 19th century, views of the Civil War changed. Liberals move away from supporting royalism and royalist thought, and they move to supporting parliamentarians. Cromwell comes bigger. Fairfax starts to emerge a bit more brighter in this time period. And people in Colchester, the Liberals and Whigs, start to say, no, do you know what? We don't like Lucas and Lowe anymore. We are now Fairfax followers. We, we like Fairfax. He is our hero. And we, we see, for example, in 1876, a massive debate between Liberals and Conservatives about who was right, Lucas or Lyle or Fairfax? And this debate is huge. It lasts for weeks upon weeks in the newspapers. There's accusations being thrown. People are hurling insults to each other. It's a nasty affair because it's important of who you side with. Are you a Lucas and Lyle follower or are you a Fairfax follower? And it's, it defines your political allegiance. If you go to the 1900s, people are saying, my family fought for the royalists at the siege of Colchester. This is how ingrained it was for Colchester in this period. Local conservatives would say, my family's grandfather's father, he was part of the royalist horse at Colchester, or they were part of the Pomeranian horse in Colchester. It defines your political allegiance in this time period, which I think is so important. So the legacy is political. Yeah, there's certainly a political legacy. And you know, historians have said that quite often. You know, There's books written about the political legacy of, of, of the Civil War. And yes, there is. But for certainly for Colchester, it is even more so. It defines politics, and people would often go and talk about it. 
it gets so political actually that even in the cultures of the urban layout we find the seeds being referenced and known you look at cultures road names we find names to the Cromwell was the first road name ever built referencing to the Civil War. And of course, that was built by the Liberals who built that road name. Fairfax was the next one to get a road. And then Lucas and Noel get a road. I think that's probably because they don't want to offend the Conservatives too much. So they allow road names to be named after these kind of figures. But we do, we do see this kind of contention in local politics, even down to road names or what should be named what. Because again, there's contention. It's really important of who you sided with. And later on, later on in the period, we start seeing Capel get a road name, Goring, and other royalists get their, their names in Colchester. But much later on, it's the more key figures who get their names first as well. And I think you find, especially towards the end of the 19th century, when you get more ideas of reconciliation in kind of open politics, that we start seeing people accepting Fairfax Road and, and Lucas Road a bit more and they were done in the 1830s and 40s as well. But it is political. Um, but it's not just to just put the political aspect to the road layout. A lot of road names and cultures that get renamed in the 18th in the in the 19th century to seed sites. Uh, the Abbey gets uh, gets a few names in Colchester, for example, because people identify themselves with ruins, with with the old ruins of Colchester. That isn't necessarily down to the siege, but it reminds us that these siege sites, these siege ruins have a massive part of Colchester's identity of its image, that they're naming, renaming roads throughout the town after these these landmarks that dot around Colchester. Again, isn't isn't necessarily down to complete the Civil War that, but again, we start seeing the importance of these buildings for local reasons, for local identity, local pride, and the like. I think perhaps the most important legacy of the Civil War, and the most unique one, is a tourism boom in the 1840s and up until 1930s of the Civil War. Now, this is really unique because the Civil War, you wouldn't think would be a tourist attraction, would you? I don't know how many of you, well, for me it would be, and for some of us maybe it would be, but for maybe for us part of us, you think it probably wouldn't be a great draw. I've had this actually a debate with someone very recently, actually, who argued, no, the tourist attraction was Roman history, it was Roman history, and I'm thinking, actually, it's not. If you look at the guides that are published from 1840 to about 1930, Roman history doesn't take that that pop that bigger prominence in advertising Colchester. It isn't the main focus. It will be for the Castle Museum, yes, but generally for guidebooks are published for people to read and to kind of get a, a feel for Colchester. The siege takes centre place. It takes centre place. Why? Well. How you advertise a town in eighteen in the eighteen hundreds is that you'd use the ruins to advertise Colchester, you know the St Bernard's Priory or the Abbey Gate or St Giles Church. You'd use those places as images. And then you've got to tell their story, and what better to tell a story than the romantic martyrdom of Lucas and Lyle and the tragedy of the siege? It draws people in, and the first one, the first reports of the railway being opened notes that people get off. And they go to visit the ruinous sites of St. Botoff's, the Abbey Gate, and St. Giles Church, which is where Luke Snell are entombed. It's such a unique thing here. We don't find this anywhere else in England that I know of, to see it being such an intrinsic part. And it's why I find it interesting today, because Newark has a civil war centre, and I don't want to attack Newark's civil war centre because it's a wonderful, brilliant site, and people there do a fantastic job, and you know, it's wonderful. But I think Colchester should have done something before all this because Colchester clearly was the main attraction for the Civil War, or at least one of the main attractions for the Civil War. It, it, it appealed to people's interest. People were, were, were drawn in by the imaginative nature of it or being able to, to imagine the scenes themselves. Round, one of the local historians, uh, J.H. Round, says about, says about you know, going for, uh, at the top of the castle and seeing the Civil War from the top of the castle, seeing the action taking place. He's romanticizing it, of course he is, but he's transform he's transporting people from their from their rooms, from from their workplaces into Colchester using the seed. It tracks people so so well. Like any other place. I've looked at guidebooks and other other towns and cities. Colchester wins by a mile. And this would remain in Colchester at least to the nineteen thirties, where the siege would come still be a very important part of Colchester's story, of, of tourism, of its tourist trade um, in this period. So tourism is very, very important. And why 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 does his legacy survive? Because it attracts people. 
I think that maybe a quick, quick, quick question you can ask is why does the Civil War trap people? Again, people are very interested in this period about the idea of heroes. Heroes fascinates people. They love the idea of heroes and villains. And the idea of romantic deaths as well. Think about uh, especially 1914 and the, the First World War and what was used to attract people to the army of you know, the, that kind of the sport analogies that people say, you know, play the game and that, that kind of analogies that was used in the First World War. It's going on in the 19th century. And this is why I think this comes to appeal because you've got that story of heroes, of, of last stands almost, you know, of heroic deaths, of defiance as well against against the possible odds. I think that's the reason why it's so attractive. Maybe why it loses its, its, its appeal as well in the in the post-First World War and also definitely post-Second World War. It loses its appeal. But I think because of that, that, that change of narrative that goes on in society and people cultures that don't change that narrative in their own town. But another reason why a legacy of the Civil War takes place is because of local civic pride in the late sorry, in late eighteenth late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. Now, this is a big topic and I can't do it justice in the amount of minutes I have left on this on this talk. But what we get in the in the in the Early 20th century, we get a town hall being built in Colchester, and we have a pageant that's performed in 1909. Now, the pageant also is a tourist trade as well, it's a massive tourist image. But when Colchester builds these things, when it performs this pageant, the Civil War is certainly on its mind. It could have ignored it, it could have forgotten it. It's, it's a controversial, it's, it's a divisive topic. It could have ignored it for both its sites, and I think it would have been reasonable for to do so because it can be quite problematic, but it doesn't. Instead, it embraces it. It kind of owns it. it. It cements itself with this identity. So in the town hall, yes, we don't find any of the civil references on the outside because of its diverse nature. And they're very much aware of it, so they don't want to make a big deal of it. But if you go into our town hall, you'll find many paintings, or you, you, you would find in 1909, many paintings of Lucas, of Lyle, of Fairfax, of Ireton, of Lady Fairfax, and loads of civil figures, Capel, and, all, and these kind of people because they were important for Colchester. They owned this history. It was their history, and no one's going no one to take it away from them. But I think it was really, I think it's quite a nice sentiment here. They owned it. It was in their town hall, and it remained there even to this present day. The pageant is another example of this. They could have easily avoided it. Lewis Parker, who's the person who organises the pageant, who is the kind of top dog of the pageant, we, we could say, he's uncomfortable with it. He doesn't talk about civil war in any of his other pageants. He avoids it. In Colchester, he's made, I think, um, to perform it. But what he's very, he's very careful about it. It's the only performance he performs first before the town council and local elite because he's worried about it presenting the wrong image. So he performs it in private before the pageant is displayed. They like it, they love it, and it goes into the pageant at the end. Uh, it's the last performance of the pageant. People go away with that in their mind of Lucas and Lyle's a heroic death of their martyred death and even at the end of the pageant they say in that that colchester you know has struggled throughout the last few centuries because of the ruinous nature that it was left in pretty much but there's hope for the future there's a the bright spark for the future they say but again they're trying to put their understand the contemporary world why they're not as big as birmingham manchester down to the civil war but we find that we see this kind of both sides, the Whigs, the Tories, the Conservatives, the Liberals, people from all ages. There's children here, there's, there's, there's older folk here, people from different classes are involved in the pageant. They all seem to really enjoy the Civil War episode. We know that school children were taken to the sea sites. We know they went to, to visit the site of Lucas and Lyle's death. We know that people really knew a lot about this topic. We know that Sunday school me messages were talk talked about the Civil War. It clearly was a big part of Colchesterian history think is so important so when 1909 comes around and civic pride comes around Colchester owns this history it is their history and no one's going to take it away from them and that remains um really uh up until i think for really second world war i i love this this song that sung at george's um i think it's his jubilee um and i think it's a wonderful song that sung in castle park in 1935 Here's a health unto his majesty. All cavaliers will please combine with a, with a fa la 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 to drink his, this loyal toast of wine. And then the second bit. If anyone should answer no, I only wish that he may go with a roundhead rogue to Jericho. 
So we still see, don't we, this Willis story that still, still permeates throughout Colchester's history. I'm not sure if the Liberals would have been very happy with that song being sung, but we, we do see this big connection in Colchester. Why? Because they were proud of this history. It was what they were talking about. And today, I don't know how many of you know about levelling up and all these things I've talked about and pride of place and these kind of things that have been talked about in contemporary you know, fields of scholarly scholar debates. I think you could t- certainly say that culture still certainly proud of their history uh, in 1935 with a song like that anyway. But I think what is crucial here, culture cements itself, its identity in its civil war past. Yes, the Romans are important. Yes, medieval stories are important. I don't want to take that away from those histories. They, are, of course, are important. But the civil war, I think, is so intrinsically important to culture's identity. And I think that is yeah, that is important to talk about. What about Humpty Dumpty? I have just one more, two more comments to make. Is Hump Dumpty a legacy from the Civil War? Is it a legacy from the siege? No, it's not. And I'm sorry to say that. You might want to leave this right now and, 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 and rage quit from this from this talk. But we do also get these fabrications as well that appear in the 1980s, 1990s about Hump Dumpty coming from the siege, about coming from Samaria at the Wall, being blown up and... Um, the story of being Dumpty coming from there, you know, all the king's horses couldn't be, couldn't, put, couldn't, be, couldn't put it back together again. It's not true. There's no, no one mentions it until 1980. Uh, and so I'm sorry to break anyone's hearts there. That isn't a, a truth. I know if, it's, if anyone here from Visit Colchester, I know you're going to use it anyway at some point. You know, go ahead, <laughs> use it uh, for your for tourism. But but in terms of, of actually the reality, it, 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 it's not actually a true true story and so we do we do get some fabrications that do emerge for that time um but this was the w- weirdest one that that emerged this weird story of Hump dumpty because there's no historical st- knowledge for it so i don't know why it, it emerged but there there we go so i guess my last slide really is what about today well there's certainly been decline the second world war sees a decline of the civil war in colchester uh, we do see, of course, uh, Sir Charles Lucas School being built uh, in the 60s, I think it is, maybe before that. Uh, we do see some references to Civil War, some plays that were formed, and there's a, there's a few reenactments that are done. But generally, we see it declining. Tourism, specifically, Coldest Col- moves away from the siege in its tourism approach. Uh, many because Col- 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 moves away from historic nature anyway. In the 60s and 50s, it moves away from history towards modern to modernity. Uh, which is a I could I could run about that, but I won't go. I won't do it here. Um, but the Civil War gets impacted by that. It, it it doesn't see light of day as much as it did in the 19th century. And in the last few decades, yeah, it certainly has declined in legacy. But I think we're seeing a new chapter. I think we're seeing a new chapter. And this, you know, maybe people want to debate this with me. Maybe we're not seeing a new chapter, but I think we are. I think Visit Colchester doing a great job with this. Uh, not that I'm trying to butter them up here, but I think they're doing a great job with it. With with with, with bringing it back into the public sphere. I think more can be done with it, with the siege. I think I said Newark have the Civil War Centre. I think Colchester, Colchester could do something massive with the siege, own it, really truly take it and grasp it and own it as its own because it's so unique, it's so interesting um, and could be such a great way of educating people about warfare, about sieges. I don't know, but that's just my, my, my view. I know this year we've got the Colchester Siege Spectacular, which I think is going to be incredible. I'll, I'll put I'm hoping to put some time off to go and visit it as well to make notes and to, to critique it. Um, so that will be interesting. Um, I don't know why I didn't ask me to be part of it, really, to be honest. But that's by and by. Uh, I won't hold it against them. Um, but there we go. I think it's only it's coming back to Renaissance. We are seeing this in towns throughout England, a renaissance of history. It'll be interesting to see where it ends up in the next few years. So maybe I'll have to revisit this uh, in the next few years to come. So that's me for now uh if you have any questions please do put them on in in the question box in the comment box i'm happy to answer everything i know i probably haven't covered everything you wanted me to cover i've talked for 40 minutes anyway and that's 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 ridiculous isn't it really i talk too much people would say but if you have any questions please do ask them i'm happy to answer anything about 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 this topic um it's really interesting and not many things about it um so any questions please do ask away. I also will say, uh, mind you, please do subscribe as well to the channel because we want to get that to 1,400 subscribers. Uh, 
would be great to, to see. Um, so yeah, I will wait for your questions if you have any. I can I can imagine you're typing them out now, so I don't want to don't want to rush you in that regards. Or or maybe you have um, asked. And I can't see it. Maybe that's the reason why why as well. We'll give it a few moments in case you do have any questions. I will say just I have deliberately avoided to make a, a, a come down a side of any Willis or Palmer turns myself. I know that people do have a, have a staunch view on it. Some people are Lucas and Lyle supporters, but others are Fairfax fans. That's fine. That's all good. I think they're both are legitimate stances. <laughs> are there no questions? No, no one got a got a sneaky question to ask me. I, I am I am shocked. Maybe I have spoken and bored you guys to de- Oh, there's two questions to come up. <laughs> I'll say that two questions come up. Oh dear, I say that. Um one question comes which says, why do you think the Civil War faded especially for tourism after the Second World War? Good question. Very good question. Do you know what? There, there's a there's a research topic on this. There should be re- there should be a re- research topic on this. Um from what I know about the Civil War, I think there's a few reasons. One is because I think the, the idea of modernity comes into the into, into the post-war period. So people don't want to talk about history as much. They want to talk about modernity, new things, and, and, and the future. History takes a bit of a back burner in general public discourse. But I think for Colchester as well, I think the idea of tragedy, of suffering, of death, I think it kind of puts people off. The idea of Englishman versus Englishman isn't necessarily a story to tell or to appeal to people. Uh, the idea of destruction, for example, people, people remember the Blitz and Coventry talk about the structure of town probably wasn't the most appealing story to talk about. And I think that's one of the reasons why people try to avoid it more, because it's more difficult. There's also the issue as well in the post-war period that it the Civil War becomes very, very political. Uh, left-wing historians, the Marxist historians, would, would rally around the Civil War and, and kind of use it as a as, as a means to present, like, you know, communist or so, say socialist histories. And I think Black Town's a bit nervy about about kind of linking themselves to those histories as well. You know, Colchester wasn't very much of a uh, staunch, staunch socialist town, so it probably would want to avoid that, those connections as well. Some towns didn't. Some towns embraced that. You know, some towns which, which did embrace the levellers, for example. We go to Oxfordshire, some places there, which embraced that kind of tourism trade in the 80s. But Colchester didn't. And I think that's probably another reason why, is because of the political nature of it. Um, which is quite remarkable, because if you look at the 8th, 9th century, people in Colchester used the political stories of, 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 of the Civil War, but just used it for their own means. I think I think that's a massive miss for people in in nineteen hundreds. They 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 fail to re reuse and reinterpret history. Which I think is a really tragic site. So there's a variety of reasons you're trying to say. I think post war memories of the civil of, of the war itself, modernity, and also the political nature of the civil war, which I think makes it a bit more complex with the rise of communism as well. I hope that answers that question anyway. Um, a question from Alan. Under Cromwell, we saw the turn of the Jewish community in England and Colchester. Did the community make any reference to the siege? Uh, it's a good question, actually. I think I've, someone asked me that one recently, actually, somewhere else. I don't actually know. There's no actually reference to the Jewish community in um, Fairfax's letter. You remember, when, when Cromwell allows the Jews the Jewish community to return, that's probably post... Sec, post sec, uh, I believe it's a post... Second Civil War. You maybe correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, so they will certainly come in later uh, after the siege. What will be interesting will be their views on seeing the sites. I don't actually have those. I don't know if there's, if there's much recording of it, but I would know for certainly that they would certainly be shocked by what they saw. Um, we know it seems like whenever someone visits Colchester in this period, they are shocked by what they see. Um, it's, it's the idea of brutality, though what they would take of it, who, who, whose side they would take, I don't know. That would be an interesting topic uh, to think about. So thank you, Alan, for that. I, I hadn't really thought about that uh, as much. Um, but the key thing is, is, is yeah, 1656, so 10 years, not 10 years, eight years after the siege, um, they arrived. So 
for them, they would have seen the, seen the ruins, they would have seen the destruction and, and devastation caused. They certainly would have their own views on it. What those views are, I don't know. But it's only interesting thing to think about, um, certainly, uh, about it. But again, it reminds us, doesn't it, that different people come to Colchester to interact with these ruins. They interact with these sites. They engage with them, and they undoubtedly would have engaged, engaged with them as well. Um, so that would be interesting to, to think about, um, certainly. Are there any other questions people like to ask about this? Whether, whether it's p- the political nature of the, of the Civil War, whether it's tourism, whether it's film, or whether it's documentary, please do ask. I'm happy um, to hang around for longer in case there are any more questions. What I find interesting, uh, we also, in the 19th century, I'll just talk about very briefly, we do see there's also a reenactment of the siege in the 19th century. They also re- reenact the siege. They're, very, they're, they're certainly taken up by it. <laughs> Let's just, let's just say that um, uh, in that time period. Are there any other points of discussion people like to, to make? I would say another thing to mention is that when the debate happens 1806 between Liberals and Conservatives, a lot of Liberals actually come from outside Colchester. So actually uh, they travel in to, 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 to debate that. Um, and yeah, no, actually, no, no, not all locals. So, a book, another question which book would I personally recommend about the actual conduct of the siege? Um, good question. Um, there aren't many books on the siege. Um, yeah, I mean, Alan says in his comment here, he remembers in the 1980s they still not do the reenactment of the siege. Yeah, we do find reenactments briefly in the 80s and 90s um they've come more common actually more recently actually but in terms of books uh barbara barbara donegan a book on the war in england she has a whole chapter dedicated to the, the siege of colchester and that's probably, that's probably one of the best academic works on it i would recommend her work she does she's done quite a few works on the siege she's, she's probably the the, the best historian. If you want to know the, the details of the seed itself, check her works out on, on it. I say academic, though they are very readable actually. I recommend completely. Um, if you want to know the, kind of the impact on buildings, then Stephen Porter's work um, on, on on the Civil War landmarks, very important. To, he mentions a few, few, a few lines, a few paragraphs, a few pages actually on Colchester in the immediate time period. And then you've obviously got people like uh, Peter Jones's work, more local stuff, um, which are also very important. So they're kind of the things. If you want local story and Peter Jones, maybe if you want um, academic, Barbara Donegan. And then if you want kind of buildings, then then you want Stephen Porter. Uh, all my all my own PhD thesis. There we go. You can access it online. It's for free <laughs> if you want to read that. I don't know why you would, but it's there if you want to read it. Um, my thesis was all about this later on, as well. Uh, but there aren't many books uh, really about 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 these topics. Um, yeah, and especially legacies. There's no books about legacies. I think that's a bit of a a bit of a sad thing to talk think about, really. Are there any other questions? I've got a few more minutes, so I'm happy to take anything else. I would say actually one thing that takes place in the 9th century as well, just to think what I thought about it. Henry Ireton gets more of a uh, uh, more negative view as the century goes on. Like It feels as though um, when um, Fairfax becomes more of a hero for liberals. They found a new villain, and they found that villain in Henry Ireton. <laughs> Fun fact for you. Uh, were there any women characters during the siege? Now, this is a good question. Um, there's none that I am fully aware of uh, in terms of the siege. Now, there is, he said that's about part of legacy, there is someone. Uh, whose names escapes me for now, so this is really embarrassing. Um, it's I can't remember. I also don't remember the, 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 
it's the per- so someone's put in charge. This is be bad historical knowledge, isn't it? Someone using the word someone, the someone who's put in charge of um, cultists is kind of because they aim it after the civil war or after the siege is to destroy the, 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 the war of Colchester. Um, and the guy who's put in charge, he's, he's meant to destroy the wall, and his wife pleads on Colchester's behalf to not destroy the wall because she's from Colchester, her family's from Colchester. I can't remember her name, and it's really annoying me now. I, uh, you can find it, you can find it on, on, online. I would go Google, but that just, I just, I better admit that I don't know her name or his name either. Uh, but they, uh, but she's interestingly important. She keeps basically, she's the whole reason that Colchester keeps it's actually Roman wall. Uh, intrinsically important. In terms later on in the periods, uh, Cecilia Fines is is huge uh, uh, in terms of travel writing in Colchester's siege legacy. Crucial person to think about uh, in that regard. And then when we get into the 19th century, there's certainly uh, interesting writers. Uh, uh, Mat- uh, Matilda Houston writes a book on it's sort a of like romantic novel, but she bases a lot, a uh, part of it, in the ruins of of of, of the Civil War. Which I think is 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 quite fascinating. You know, she bases her book, or you know, f- a romantic scene, you know, through through the ruins of the Civil War of, of Bottles Parry, actually, to be exact. Which I think is interesting that these ruins are an important part of their their legacy. Um, and again, as I said in the talk, you do also have like the, the women's uh, liberal association who use the civil war a lot in their in their meetings and their talks as well and even when you get to the pageant um very intrinsically important as well in the performance of of it as well and and and, in, and that kind of thing so very important yeah it, it generally this is a big problem with with especially between writers and they're, they're generally sadly the men come to the, the surface first because you know they're they're how Victorian society uh, was, uh, sadly, uh, but certainly there, there was some 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 people uh, around as well. Um, there's a Benjamin Strutt. When he, when he draws a painting about the siege in the 1700s, he dedicates his painting to a local baroness as well, because also they wanted to show their their loyalty and allegiances. It's not just men who wanted to show their loyalty and allegiances to the monarchy. The women did as well. Both men and women wanted to show their allegiances to, to the monarch. So they would also uh, also commission portraits, paintings of these figures. I think that's also a very important thing to think about. So I didn't really answer that question well enough. Alan, your, your, your questions are, are, are you, you keep getting me with questions. I love it. <laughs> um, but there certainly are uh, people involved. And I should know their names. That's the, uh, especially the person who helped to keep the wall. That's that's bad of me, isn't it? <laughs> Do apologise. Well, I think we're coming to to our to our to our end. I don't think there's any more questions coming through. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it informative. Uh, I hope you, you know, hope you can. You can tell people about it in your in your own um, own times. Uh, we have got we do have another talk coming up in a few weeks, I believe. Uh, it hasn't been posted online yet, but we do have a talk coming up hopefully. And then we take our break for summer. We come back in September time. So do stay tuned for more history and door talks. They'll, they'll be coming through. I hope we'll be hosting uh, more and more of them. Um, but thank you for now, and hopefully I will see you all in the near future. So I'll say bye and uh, we'll see you very soon.